G'day, Pastor Blake here. Thanks so much for watching this message today. I pray that this sermon and resource would help grow you in your relationship with Jesus, also in conjunction with a local church. If you have any questions about our church, you can head to our website, devonportcoc.com.au. Again, thanks for watching this message today, and I do hope that it blesses you in your love and devotion towards Jesus Christ. Good morning, church. I'm sorry that I'm unable to be with you in person this morning, but how wonderful is technology that even while I'm in isolation, even while I'm at home, uh, I'm still able to share with you. Uh, that is such a, such a good thing. So I've been doing a little bit of research over the past couple of weeks about the start of the pandemic and just the number of farmers that needed to get rid of their harvest and their produce because restaurants shut down and the supply and demand, supply and demand chain just uh, got all out of whack. In fact, as I was researching it, I discovered that there was one farmer that had to bury 450 thousand kilograms of onions almost half a million kilos of onions just buried in a pit now that works out to be around 2.7 million onions that just go to waste there was another farmer that was forced to dump bury and destroy over 900,000 kilos of beans and cabbages Again, almost a million kilos of vegetables that just go to waste and need to be destroyed. A dairy farmer needed, ran out of space to store their milk and so they had to dump over 14,000 kilograms of milk. Now, those numbers are from individual farmers. They're from individual farms, but those stories and those numbers they are not unique. This, this is a story that was seen all around the world. Those examples that I mentioned, they came from America. But I found articles this last week from the UK, from India, from Ukraine, from Australia, that all described farmers who either were forced to destroy their crops or they were forced to watch their harvest just rot on the vine. It had to remain unpicked because they didn't have the labour to be able to pick it. And you know, that was actually a really big issue in Australia and here in Tasmania, where we rely on backpackers and seasonal workers to be able to harvest our stuff. Now, I want you to just stop and think about that picture for a moment. Just think about those farmers. They pour so much time, so much effort, so much money into planting their crops. They water them, they fertilize them, they tend the crops because they want to have the best yield that they can have. And so they put all this time and effort into them. You know, farmers are some of the most hardworking people you can know. They are up early and they are doing physical labor. So just consider the devastation that they must feel. That emotional and mental devastation when all of a sudden half a million kilograms of onions just get buried in a pit on their farm. When they have to watch their harvest just rot, unpicked from the vines because they don't have enough workers and help to be able to pick all that is there. Can you, can you imagine how difficult that must be? Can you imagine how much that must hurt? See, this year as a church, we have a theme, no regrets. And uh, this year we wanna make sure that we are living our lives with no regrets. We wanna make sure that there is no regrets in our personal discipleship with the Lord. There are no regrets in our attitude and actions towards the lost. And there are no regrets 
in our personal relationships with others. These are three huge areas of life. And as we approach Easter this year, we have been exploring the book of Luke and some of the stories of regret that we find in there. We've seen the story of a builder's regret, when the foundation isn't actually dug strong and how we in our lives can forget to build that foundation at times when we cannot do the work and the regret that comes from that. There is the followers regret for those who don't actually count the cost of following Jesus. They get caught in the hype and the excitement and they forget that it's actually a hard journey and a hard road. Well, today I want to explore another story of regret, and this comes from Luke chapter 10, and it's the harvester's regret. This is the same kind of regret that farmers have been feeling through the pandemic. The regret of a harvest that is ready to be picked, but it just goes to waste instead. Now, Luke chapter 10 is a great chapter, and there is so much in it, but today I want to just focus on verses 1 and 2. So let's read Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 2. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. See, Jesus would often use examples from the world around them to help explain spiritual things. Now, when Jesus is talking about a harvest, he might have been surrounded by wheat fields or chickpea fields, but he's not talking about a food harvest. Instead, he's talking about a harvest that is worth so much more. He tells us what kind of harvest he is interested in in Luke chapter 5, Verses 31 to 32, where it says, Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, Jesus isn't interested in the wheat or the chickpeas or the lettuce or the fruit. Jesus' harvest is bringing people into his kingdom. The harvest that Jesus talks about is people. Jesus knows that there are those who are outside of the kingdom of God. They are outside of relationship with God. And because of his great and awesome love, he wants to bring them into the kingdom. He wants them to understand that they are missing a relationship with their creator. And that there is a way that that relationship can be restored. In fact, This was a burden that Jesus felt throughout all of his ministry and his time on earth. We regularly see Jesus had compassion on the crowds who met him in towns, in villages, and even on the road. Jesus would look at the people that he saw and his heart would break. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were hurting. They were broken. They were in need of love and healing. And so many of them didn't even realize that they needed rescuing. They just thought this is life. But Jesus' heart was so strong and so burdened for them that he gave himself for them. He allowed his body to be beaten and broken for him. He allowed himself to die on the cross for them, whether they realized it or not. I don't know about you, but I think that we can sit in church for so long and we can hear this message so many times that it becomes a little bit blasé. It kind of loses its importance. But this harvest, this bringing of people into the kingdom, this is a matter of eternal importance. When Jesus looked and he saw the people around him, when he saw the people going about their own lives, he knew this mission was important because this mission matters for eternity. Because at the core of this matter, 
This harvest is about saving people from eternal separation with God. We want to save them from hell. Now, I know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I know that Jesus is the only way to salvation and to a relationship with God. I know that. But when I'm face to face with people at times, I, those words sometimes stick in my throat a little bit. Because when you're looking at somebody else, those words are hard to say. Those words are hard to take because to the world, those words are offensive. Christianity is exclusive. Jesus' claims are exclusive. And that can be hard to share at times because you don't know how somebody's going to react. But just because it's hard to share doesn't mean that we shouldn't share. Just because it's hard to share doesn't mean it's not still truth. And in fact, it actually, when we look at it and we see that this is exclusive, that this is uh, offensive to the world, it highlights the importance of this harvest because we are dealing with something that has eternal impact. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel kind of heavy when I think about that. And that's a good thing because the truth is we need to feel the burden that comes from this harvest. Jesus felt that burden every time he saw people around him. That's why in our passage today, he's appointing the 72. And it's why at the start of Luke chapter 9, he appoints the 12 to go out and to do the things that he has been doing, to share the good news of the kingdom with people. Because as Jesus looks at the people around him, as he looks at people going about their lives, he notices that there is something else really important about this harvest. See, this isn't just any old harvest. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful. This is a bountiful harvest. There is so much that needs to be brought in. This isn't just going over fields that have already been gleaned or trying to get the few blackberries that the birds and other creatures of the field have missed. No, this harvest is plentiful. It is big. This week I did a little bit of working out thanks to my friend, Mr. Google. Did you know that roughly, and with a bit of rounding, there are 7.9 billion people in the world today. 7.9 billion. Now, that's a lot of people. And I'll be honest, a billion as a number, it doesn't mean much to me. But according to research released in December last year, that means that there are around 2.5 billion Christians in the world. It's roughly 32% of the world that proclaims Christianity. Now, I might have a few quibbles with that number. I think it would be less. But let's just say 32% is correct. There are around 2.5 billion Christians out of 7.9 billion people. That means that there are over 4.4 billion people that still need to hear about Christ. Now, those numbers are big. They, they kind of don't make any sense to me. So let's make them a little bit closer to home. If we look at Devonport's population and we use those ratios, there would be around 8,033 Christians living in Devonport. Now, that might seem like a lot. And I don't know what your reaction to that is. Maybe you're surprised that it's not higher. Maybe you're expecting it to be lower. But we can't just look at that number of 8,033. We have to look at the flip side of that number. So if there are 8,033 Christians in Devonport, that means that there is still a harvest of 17,713 people who need to be invited into the kingdom. There are over 17,000 
thousand people just in our city who need to know about the kingdom of God, who need to know that there is a God who loves them and who wants a relationship with them. There are over 17,000 people who need to know and hear about the love of Christ. There are over 17,000 people that Jesus has a burden and a concern for just in our city to respond to the gospel. Now, these numbers may not be exact. They're, they're estimations, but they're enough to tell a story. Let me actually simplify this a little bit further. These numbers tell us for every one person who professes faith in Jesus, there are two more people who still need to hear who he is. Let Look at the seat to your left. And now look at the seat to your right. For everybody who is sitting in that room today, there is the need for those seats beside you to be filled with people who don't yet know Jesus. People who are not yet part of our church. There is the need for the harvest to be brought in. Sit with that for a moment. The harvest is plentiful. Because sometimes we can get caught up in this feeling that the world around us doesn't care about God. That the world around us is anti-God. And you know what? And that's true. The world, the structures, the society around us, it is anti-God. The mob that is people gathered together is anti-God. Just look at the crowd of people that worshipped Jesus and cried out Hosanna on Palm Sunday and then a week later shouted, crucify him, crucify him. The mob, people gathered together in that group, it is anti-God. And we need to remember that when we choose to follow Jesus, we're choosing to set ourselves against the culture of the day. We're choosing to set ourselves against society. But while those things might be anti-God, the individuals who make up that whole, they are people who are broken and hurting and seeking connection. They are people who are seeking to fill the gap that they have inside, that sadness that comes from being disconnected with God, with their maker. Society as a whole is trying to run away from Christianity. People are seeking to try and find what is happening inside. And when we look at the individuals, when we see beyond just the whole big structures, we see that Jesus' words are as accurate today as they were back then. The harvest is plentiful. There are many many out there outside of the kingdom that are crying out to be brought into the kingdom. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't people who are hostile to the gospel. Absolutely, there are. There are people out there who are exceedingly hostile to God, to Christianity, to those who try to share what they believe. But they're also not as common as we might sometimes feel. The vast majority of people are seeking something, but they don't know what. And we can share that with them. Well, and as for those who are hostile, Jesus actually helps us to know what to do later on in Luke chapter 10. In verses 10 to 11, he says, But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. <clears throat> Jesus tells us it is okay for us when we face hostile people to not feel we have to spend all of our time and all of our effort with them. Instead, there are places that might be more appropriate for our focus to be. But instead, we should warn them and move on. Now, that's a hard lesson to learn. But in our church, we often speak of people of peace. 
that comes from this chapter of Luke. It is those who are open to the message of the kingdom, open to those who share it. The harvest is plentiful. And there are so many that need to hear this message that we need to put our time and effort into the places where it matters most. Now, we often speak of people of peace in our church. Those people who are open to the message, they might not be Christians, they might not be followers, but they are open and they are ready to hear. That comes from this chapter in Luke. And it's something that we need to be aware of. We need to put our effort to those people of peace. But we also have to remember that the person who is a person of peace to you might actually be hostile to me. And the person who is a person of peace to me might be hostile to you because of the relationships that we have with them already. And so we can trust and we can pray for God to raise up those who can approach those who are hostile. But we also need th this harvest is plentiful and it's important. So we need to make sure we put our time and our effort where it matters. And Jesus actually continues in verse two. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus points out to the people around him that even though there is much to be harvested, but the workers are few. Jesus is looking at the people around. He's seeing this incredible, this plentiful harvest, people who are ripe to be picked these people who are hurting, who are broken, who need to be brought into the kingdom where they can find life and healing and who they were meant to be. And he looks at the people that he has, the people who are following him. And he looks again at the harvest and he says, the workers are few. Jesus is warning us that there's a lot of work to be done and this work is going to be hard and it is going to take time. This work is going to take a lot of effort because there are more people to be brought into the kingdom than there are already in the kingdom. Now, I mentioned before, for every person who claims the title of Christian, there are more than two people who still need to be brought into the kingdom. Now, that statistic is a lot better than it was in Jesus' time. We have made good headway, but You'd hope so after 2,000 years. In all honesty, I think that we should have made more headway. And I think that the reason that we haven't, and the other reason why Jesus tells us that the workers are few, is because he knows that while people may claim the name of Christian, not all of them choose to be laborers in the field. Now, they should be. Jesus has called called all of us to go and make disciples, to share what he has taught us. And when people don't labor in the fields, they're leaving themselves open to the harvester's regret. They are leaving themselves open to when they stand before the throne of Jesus and they get to the end of their lives and they see everything with, the inter with an eternal perspective. And they see what really matters. We want to know that we have done everything we can. We want to know that we have labored in the fields, that we have done all we can to bring in this harvest. We didn't just leave it to other people. So why do Christians not labor in the fields? Well, as I finish this message today, I want to give you two reasons. The first is this. They've forgotten the burden. I've said it before and I'll keep on saying it. Jesus isn't interested in a food harvest. His harvest is to call sinners to repentance, to invite people into the kingdom. This harvest is one that has eternal consequences for the people around us. But sometimes when we have been around church for a while, following Jesus can become routine. We can forget the incredible grace that has been shown to us. We can get caught up in the distractions of life, 
of serving at church, of doing all the things that come with following Jesus, but we forget why we actually found it in the first place. There's a line in the song Hosanna by Hillsong, and it, it's a line that always stands out to me. And it says, break my heart for what breaks yours, everything I am for your kingdom's cause. If we truly pray for God to break our hearts for what breaks his, then our eyes are going to be open to see the harvest around us because there are so many people who are separated from God, so many people who are broken, who are hurting, who are in need of the love that is found in Jesus Christ. There is a plentiful harvest of eternal consequence around us and we need to feel that burden. We need to know that it matters. We need to be reminded of that and to feel what Jesus feels with that. But there's a flip side because we need to make sure we don't over feel that burden. Because as we go and as we harvest, God's not asking us to save people. We can't save people. All God is asking us to do is get out into the fields and allow his spirit to use us. God's not asking us to feel the burden of every person who doesn't know God because to feel that would destroy us. It would overwhelm us. Now, God wants us to feel the burden, the importance of this harvest and what we do, but also to remember it is his spirit that moves people to repentance. It's not our eloquence of message. It is not our logical arguments it's his spirit. There is a tightrope we need to walk and balance on between feeling the burden and knowing that it is God who saves people, not us. We merely provide opportunities for God to work and to use us. So that's the first reason that, that Christians don't labor in the fields. The other reason is this. I don't feel equipped. I don't feel gifted. I don't feel cold. The second reason that Christians don't labor in the fields is because they think that evangelism is for the Billy Grahams of the world. And it is true that there are people in this world who are gifted as evangelists. The late Reverend Dr. Billy Graham is one of those people. In his lifetime, he has worked hard in the fields. He has brought so many people to faith. Allow God's spirit to draw them into the kingdom. And the organization that he has left behind is continuing to do amazing and incredible work. But even when we think on a smaller scale than people like Billy Graham, I know of speakers and people who are gifted at bringing up Christ in almost any and every situation. They're able to bring Jesus up in places and to people that you just wonder, how on earth were they able to do that? But what's more, it doesn't seem cheesy. They make it seem so natural. And then your own attempts just feel clumsy and awkward. Maybe... Maybe your own attempts have led to bad experiences that you decide, look, this just isn't for me. I will support other people doing the work, but evangelism is for them and not for me. Or maybe you want to share. Maybe you feel that burden. I need to be involved in this work, but you just don't know what to do. I don't know enough. I, I'm worried about what questions they might ask or how is this going to look when I don't have an answer or something like that. What if I make a mistake? You know, this is one of the reasons why I love this story in the book of Luke. Because most of the stories in the gospel, or most of the gospels have the story of Jesus commissioning the 12 and sending them out to do the things that it, they've seen Jesus do. But in Luke's gospel... He records the sending of the 12 out in Luke chapter 9. 
They go out and they do amazing things. They do incredible miracles and they come back to Jesus and he feeds the 5,000. He performs more miracles. He then talks about the cost of discipleship and people leave. And from the people who are left, he appoints the 72. He appoints the people who are still hanging around, even after they've heard about the cost of following him. And he sends them out. Do what you've seen me do. The reason that I love that is because the 12 represent the 12 sons of Israel. That's leadership of the church. Leaders go first. They demonstrate what needs to be done. But the 72, that represents all the members of Israel's family who went to Egypt with him. Essentially, it represents the church as a whole. Jesus sends the leaders out first to demonstrate and show that he can and will empower people. And then he sends out the 72, the rest of the church. He empowers them. He sends them out on mission. All they needed to do was keep hanging around Jesus and say, yes, I want to follow you. They didn't have to do a course. They didn't have to wait till they'd been following Jesus for a certain number of years or they'd attended a certain number of Sunday services. All they needed to do was go out and share the gospel. It wasn't only those who were gifted at it. It was just about obeying Jesus. You don't need the specific calling of an evangelist in your life to share the story of what God has done in your life. You are already called by Jesus to share the gospel. He has called all of his followers to do it. To share your story, to tell other people what has he done in your life. And when Jesus sent the 72 out, people didn't go just by themselves. They went two by two. They went to all the places where Jesus was going to go. And we live in the age of the church. We know that God is a missionary spirit. He's already gone before us. But when we choose to step out in faith, Jesus is going to be there preparing the way and using us. He just wants us to step into it. But we don't have to do it alone. Evangelism doesn't have to be by ourselves. We are part of a team. We do it with other people. We learn from other people and we learn how to share the gospel. That same gospel that changed our lives is going to change other lives too. We just have to trust God that he wants to use us to do it. So maybe you find yourself in one of those two camps. You, maybe you feel that you've forgotten that burden for the lost. Or maybe it's just that you don't feel like you're equipped or called or gifted to be in the fields. Well, Jesus actually tells us there's something that we can do about that to avoid that harvester's regret. And he tells us at the end of verse two, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We need to pray and we need to ask God, send more workers into the fields. But you know what? We can't actually just pray that and expect God to send other people. When we truly come before God and pray for him to send more workers into the fields, he's actually going to place that burden on our hearts. He's going to open our eyes so that we might see the harvest that needs to be brought in, as well as the importance of the work. He is going to start that passion for the lost that we know all around us. He's going to start that in our hearts. That's the first thing that he's going to do. But the second thing that he's going to do is that he's going to equip us to do this work. When we get into a situation where we are called to share our faith, to share the story of what God has done in our lives, he's going to help us with the words to speak. 
He is going to make his message heard in their hearts. It doesn't matter if you stammer. It doesn't matter if you start saying it and then you go, oh, wait, but I need to tell you about this first. It doesn't matter because God's spirit is going to move through you choosing to step out in faith. Oh, that's all he wants us to do. Step out in faith. Be used by him. And he will do the rest. You know, in this city of Devonport, in our lives around us, there are so many people who need to hear of the good news of Jesus Christ. We need to hear about the kingdom of God. I'd encourage you. What are, what's the one name or two names that you can start praying for? That you can ask God, God, show me the opportunities that I have to actually share my story, to share my faith with these people. And God, give me the courage to actually do it. Because the Lord of the harvest is calling for more workers to go out into the fields. Because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Will you answer the call? Will you help with the harvest and bringing people into the kingdom of God?